Welcome everyone to this safe space where we learn how to train and feed our dogs better. And today I have an incredibly, incredibly special guest that I'm still shocked I was able to connect with and bring on this live. This is such a treat, Dr. Ian Dunbar, who is a world renowned and respected uh, dog trainer, behaviorist with a veterinary degree. Um, anybody in the professional dog training world has either used his techniques or has heard of him directly, learned from him directly. So Dr. Ian Dunbar, thank you for being here. Hey, no problem. You, you asked, I said yes. It was as simple as that, wasn't it? It was as simple as that. Um, <laughs> And so I'm, I'm, I was shocked, but excited and pleasantly surprised. So I want to jump right into it to give some value up front, because I have been just itching to ask you some questions. And the first question is kind of a heavy one, um, but I want to get your thoughts as somebody who's been in the dog training industry and really focuses on the science behind it, which I think is important. What are your thoughts on punishing our dogs and how we, how do we punish our dogs and, and your thoughts around that? Well, you know, I, I think the notion, <coughs> excuse me, of punishment is sound that everyone has dogs where they want to, you know, decrease or inhibit some behaviors they find annoying or undesirable. Some they want to eliminate entirely like a barking if you live in an apartment block, but the nature of punishment um, is what, yeah, I, I mean, people just don't understand it. When you look at the definitions of punishment, and I, I, I'm writing a book at the moment, very exciting. So I actually looked at 60 different definitions of punishment from various fields, the legal field, the psychology, research, education, and so on. And 65 to 70% of them, I can't remember the exact number, don't even mention that the nature of the punishment should cause discomfort, fear, or pain. It just says a stimulus that. So throughout my entire career, I mean, as soon as I looked at that, I thought, um, well, obviously we want to do it, the stimulus, to be a pleasant one. And, I, you know, that has been my sort of lifelong sort of quest, if you like, to come up with non-aversive punishments that are altogether much quicker and much more effective than aversive means. You see, because as soon as you um, are using something nasty like a leash jerk or a shout or a slap or a shock, um, its only instructive value is the precision to which you deliver it, the timing. It has to come with, with less than half a second of the transgression, whatever it is. And um, of course, people can't do that. I mean, most people have, you know, really crummy timing and they're totally inconsistent. So it's very difficult to get a purely aversive punishment to work because you've got to get it to, to subscribe to five very specific criteria so what I do instead is I just use my voice, the dog's barking. I say, shush, he's running around like an idiot or humping the cat. I say, go to your bed, settle down. Well, that works like a punishment. It immediately eliminates the misbehavior, therefore it's a punishment, but it's in no way aversive, giving my dog guidance and instruction. So you see, this is where I think many trainers and the whole lemur thing made some huge assumptions and became very anti-punishment and negative reinforcement. And the assumptions they made were that punishment and negative reinforcement have to be aversive. Hmm. No, it didn't say that in any of the research. That was dog trainers that decided it had to be aversive back in the early 1900s. Um, so punishment is defined by its effect on behavior. It reduces undesirable behavior and eliminates it. Everyone wants that. What none of us want to do, I hope, is frighten or hurt our dogs. So we can punish. We can I even negatively reinforce using just my voice, not even raising it. So the techniques are both valid, but the way they were interpreted by dog trainers and by Lima that they had to be aversive, therefore they're wrong, they're bad, they're negative, they're, they're inhumane, 
really caused an enormous rift in the profession of dog training. And I think that's very sad. You know, way back when I founded the Association of Professional Dog Trainers, it was as an, it was an exclusive organization that said to people, you can't be members because you're nasty people or you do nasty things to dog. dogs. It was an open organization to anyone who was a dog trainer or interested in dog training. And when you think about it, who would you want to come to the conferences? Well, do you, we want to be always preaching to the choir? No, I want people to come who are training in ways that I don't necessarily agree with, so I can chat to them in the bar and convince them. And the way I convince them is, hey, get me a dog, I'll show you. But now, you know, at conferences and seminars, you don't even see a dog. The audiences don't bring their dogs like they used to. And the, the speakers usually, you know, lecturing on the stage. It used to be, I love people like Sue Sternberg. She'd say, hey, give me some dogs from the audience. I'm going to show you how to teach retrieve. And she ends up with something like an Irish wolfhound, a beagle, and a husky. And, you know, and she just trains them on stage. And it's hilarious. Because I think what people want to see is when you're working with a dog, how do you proceed when it all goes wrong? When it's falling apart, well, move to plan B. But um, so it, it's a, a sad thing, I think, because now we are left with people who focus on punishment training using, you know, old leashes, collars, and maybe shock collars. And then the other group is giving food rewards only. They never phase them out, so they never really train the dog, and they don't talk to each other. The voice, dog training has lost its voice. I mean, it's a soulless profession now. It's clinical. Uh, it's not relationship-based like it should be with you talking to your dog. By the way, once I start talking, I don't stop. So we need a cue here. So you can just do this, you know, put your finger to your lips if you think I've gone on for too long. And then we'll have another question because it's meant to be the two of us here. Oh, there you go. I've said enough. Oh, I can't hear you. What happened? Oh, dear. Okay. Sorry. Oh. There we go. I don't. So I will say one thing. You're odd. First off, everything you said, incredible. And I want to jump into it, but your audio is a little poppy, a little staticky. So are you using, a, and I don't worry about, I can edit this part out later. So don't worry about it. But uh -huh. are you using a microphone? No, just um, the one on the on the computer. Um, you might want to exit out of this and then come back in, and that might reset it. Okay, I'll do that. Yeah. And no worries, we'll 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 fix it, and I'll keep yeah. talking while you go. <laughs> all right. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. So guys, for those listening, like I'll I'll have him kind of reshare some of this stuff. But what I think is interesting is that he is encouraging, and for those just jumping in, since I'm probably going to edit this part out, let me just say this. Dr. Ian Dunbar um, is has revolutionized dog training, has been around for longer than probably most of us have been alive training dogs, and has always been focused on uh, the science behind it, which I really respect. Okay, so let's see if that sounds good. I'll let you talk. Testing, testing, testing. Hello, I'm back again. That's perfect. Okay, you sound good. Yeah. Okay. So this is insane. So what you're saying, and maybe me back up to what you're saying. You're saying that when we think of punishment from science and from research, punishment is a stimulus that, meaning it's something that uh, creates a different response. Is that a good way to explain it? Has it? effects on behavior, yeah. Effects on behavior. And what you're saying is science, specifically states that aversive punishments, which kind of sounds, I guess, a little bit of a juxtaposition, but aversive training methods that are typically used or often used in punishment, um, there's that there's no science to show that that's beneficial for a dog, especially in training. Is, is that a correct uh, understanding? Well, in research, they just said a stimulus that of course, in research, since the rats were, you know, computers were training captive rats, essentially, it's not like the computers to say to the rat, now, bad ratty, don't do that again. Yeah. 
So they had to, because their computers and didn't have a voice, either shock or give a food pellet. Well, then trainers started adopting that. On one side, you know, aversive stimuli, least jerks and alpha rollovers and all, all that stuff. And then the other side, the food pellet. Mm -hmm. And of course, when clicker training came along, then instructions went out, clear instructions and praise. So the voice is gone, but I like to train a dog. I, I use food lures and food rewards to get them off and running. Then I use my voice. And I wouldn't, you don't need food lures because now the dog understands your verbal requests and your hand signals. And you don't need a food reward because you're using rewards that are a hundred times more powerful, like go play. I mean, it, to get off leash reliability at a distance with my, my Malamute, who you can actually see in the original serious video, he does a cameo at the end. He's a hundred yards away. And I'm saying, you know, Omaha, sit, good boy, go on. The reward is continue what you're doing at a distance, whether it's sniffing another dog's rear end or sniffing the grass or, or playing with other dogs. And that way you don't need a great big bait bag and you don't use a recall as an emergency command. So the dog has to schlep all the way back to you. I just say, sit. Does he sit? Yeah, I'm in control. Okay, go play. That was the training session. It lasted one second. Yeah. That's powerful. So what you're saying in a sense is there's almost two extremes in dog training. One where there's aversive punishments, um, where it might be like the leash uh, jerking, rolling over, like you said, on the alpha roll where we put them on their back or we yell at them or smack them. That's kind of on one end. And then the other extreme is when we're just constantly just luring them with food and like food, 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 but never work to phase it out. And then if I'm hearing you correctly, the middle and where you like to live in terms of dog training is um, maybe starting off with food lures a little bit to get them going, but in the middle, trying to find ways to reward them with real life or what actually motivates them, which may be like oh, yeah. going to play. Even cued behavior problems. I'll say to a dog, shush. And if you've been quiet for a while, I'll say, okay, speak. Or let's have a barkathon driving back from San Francisco. I used to have howlathons with my Malamute. He'd put his head out the sunroof and let rip. You know, it's harming nobody, but we got to let dogs be dogs, understand, respect them as dogs, and occasionally, you know, have them let off steam. But here, here's another one for you. I'm, I'm sort of, my book is in my head. And so, yeah, please. When you say the words aversive punishment, and I remember at a board meeting for the APDT, and I said, why don't you want other trainers here then if they don't train the way you do? And uh, the board member said, I just hate seeing all these aversive punishments. And as she said that, I thought, you don't see lots of aversive punishments by definition, right? So if a punishment is defined as a stimulus that causes the immediately preceding behavior to decrease in frequency, eventually to zero. Wouldn't you expect then the need for punishments or punishments themselves to do the same? Yeah, evidence that your punishment is actually having the effect of a punishment is that they quickly decrease in frequency to zero. Are we seeing that? No, 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 no. What we are seeing is repeated and continued punishment which means that an aver most aversive punishments, by definition, are not punishments. So what are they? Well, they're aversive, so they're just aversives that you're doing to the dog on a regular basis. And how a dog would perceive that would depend on the dog, you know, like a Malinois would just shrug it off like meaningless, you know. But maybe a more sensitive dog would go, oh, that's really painful. What are you doing with these, you know, out of the blue shocks? So a punishment decreases behavior. Therefore, the frequency of punishment should quickly decrease, especially if you were using shock or say hanging a dog, heaven forbid, yeah. um, quickly decreases to zero. And so that's, you know, so the two assumptions, one that Lima made and a lot of dog trainers, that punishments have to be aversive to be effective. The second assumption is 90, 95% wrong. Because it's aversive, it must be a punishment. No, ain't happening. Mm -mm. And just understanding, I think, the very basics 
of um, the learning theory rather than getting bogged down in this insanely unnecessary and irrelevant 110 year old learning theory from computers training rats trapped in cages that has no relevance to dog training whatsoever and then coming up and it's it's the reward training that's failed too i mean why are we even talking about reinforcement schedules when you need a computer to calculate them i mean i'll try now a variable ratio reinforcement right so i'm going to give you 10 numbers and it will average out to five. So say we had it, we're teaching a stay and we had the dog on a VR5, which means on average, I'm gonna reward the dog every five seconds, but not continuously, not, not fixed every five seconds, because the dog can predict that and we'll get the same thing that happens in, in payday. Mm -hmm. They come to work Monday and you wish they weren't there. Tuesday, they're pretty slow. Wednesday, pretty good. Thursday, Friday, they're brilliant. And then you pay them. So, and they come back Monday, you know, soon, right after payday, you get a drop off of performance. So here's a VR5. I'll, I'll try and do it. It takes a lot of concentration. Okay. okay. Um, 281954 Ten numbers. They should add up to 50. Divide by 10. Who could do that when you're training a dog? Not me. I can do that because I love math but I couldn't train a dog at the same time. So why are we even talking about fixed and variable schedules? Yeah. The, you, know, you know what? Random reinforcement, being totally inconsistent, is better than all those reinforcement schedules. But even random reinforcement, plus all the schedules I've mentioned, are dumb because they all reward 50% of below median responses. You see, if we have 100 responses, they're all different, right? Different quality. And we have a median, 50 above, 50 below. Well, if you're rewarding according to some mathematical formula all the time or every fifth response or on a VR5, you're rewarding without any notion of quality. Surely part of training is we want it to get better, to look prettier, cuter, more precise or whatever. Yeah. And so, you know, these schedules just don't do that. So I don't understand, you know, this learning theory, which ironically, I introduced to dog training, but at the same time, I explained why it won't work. And here's what does work. A basic training sequence, one, two, three, four. Request, lure, response, reward. That's pretty much all you want to know, except you've got to know to phase out the lure in the first session and reduce the reliance on food by asking more for less in the first session. I but people are just life. hand feeding food till it becomes meaningless and loses all power, but becomes a bribe. Yeah, interesting. Okay, before we move on, the static is back, which is no big deal. We can edit this later. I would leave and come back and technology happens. Um, it might be, it mm. shows that you have strong internet connections. So it must be maybe like your internal mic or or something like that but um i just leave and come back in and we'll get into it and All right. just like just like dog training you know we're just going with it going with the motions and <laughs> as they life. say when they're a pet owner to a dog trainer this has never happened before um, yeah I do, right? I do do one or two zooms and lives you know but yeah. anyway i'll disappear for no a while worries. you can chat i'll come back okay yes i'll keep chatting okay so what i find First off, let me give some shout outs. Renee, I love seeing you here. Thank you. And yes, uh, Dr. Dunbar is amazing. He should do Planet Pause, I think, if he hasn't already. That would be awesome. Um, and then I saw somebody in here saying they smack their dog on the snout. It's something we do not advocate for. I'll have him talk about that. Um, Lori, thank you so much for sending in the 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 super chat wow you really didn't need to do that but i really appreciate that that's amazing hippo character with the pink hat uh, oh i see okay okay that's awesome you're so so sweet there we go so it sounds like you're good well i haven't said anything yet maybe it's my voice that's causing it <laughs> yeah it starts I, off I, strong, I was getting a little but... crackling from you too last time soon really I came back in when you spoke it was like crinkling away. Ah, interesting. Anyway. Well, we'll try. And you know what? We'll, we'll figure it out. We have to roll with the punches, I think is what the term is. But basically, okay, so let me make sure. I don't know if I understand 
a hundred percent. So I want to make sure I get it. Mm-hmm. So you're saying that, um, let me r- repeat this. What is the sequence once more? You said it's lure. Um, what oh, was the request, sequence? lure, response, reward. Request, lure, response, reward. And that is kind of like the summary of, of kind of what has been successful for you with the asterisk that lure, uh, phasing out the lure later on, at least the food lure. In the first session. In the first session is valuable. And then you talked about randomizing, um, giving treats, but that if you, um, tell me more about that. Like, cause that's well, what I typically do is like when I'm working on something, uh, I, so I don't use clicker. I use the verbal marker oh. word, which is yes. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's right or wrong, but that's just what I learned. Cause I'm not, yeah, good I use good dog. There you good go. Dog. Okay. Uh, and so what I try to do in the beginning is like, as I'm saying, yes, I'm giving a treat. And then when my dog starts to kind of almost offer that behavior or seem to kind of get it, which usually happens pretty quickly, um, then sometimes they get a treat with the yes. And sometimes they don't because I've already loaded the yes marker word. So for me, um, they seem to be happy, even if I don't give them a treat, like they seem to get excited about it. So can you tell me more, go into that a little bit more again? Well, yeah, I mean, I think the biggest problem in reward training is people give far too many food rewards. I mean, far too many, probably a hundred times more than I do. Yeah. Um, I don't use treats. I use kibble and I select the kibble by shape. I like it air dried so you can break it into eight. Because yeah. if we're classically conditioning, we're probably going to give a couple of hundred pieces. But for teaching uh, basic manners, um, I first teach them off leash on cue. So I want the dog to know what the word sit means, down, come, roll over, bed, shush, go pee. So all these behaviors I like to put on cue because that's the most convenient way to communicate with the dog. Agreed? It's so simple. And these words may be used not just to cue behaviors at our whim that we would like the dog to sit now, but also to manage behavior problems. The dog jumps up, I say sit. (laughs) The dog barks, I say shush. And we practice this by yo-yoing, woof shush, woof shush, woof shush, until the dog shush, boom, on a single command. Um, And so to put behaviors on cue, lure, lure reward training is the way to go. There's no other of the six, five other reward training techniques. There's nothing like lure reward training from teaching, we start with seven behaviors all at once. Come, sit down, sit, stand down, stand. Um, And we put them all on cue. So that's uh, four different behaviors, come, sit down and stand. But actually the position changes are six different position changes. Sit from a stand is a whole lot easier than sit up from a down. And so that's the first thing we do with the dogs. We say, hey dog, I'm your trainer, here's a treat. And then I back up and say, come here, sit. Here's another tree. Now that is a temperament test. The dog says, yeah, I'm cool about approaching and staying close and taking the treat. So then I back up again and say, come here, sit, treat. And so now um, that's come here and sit and the treat. So we're getting two behaviors for a treat. You you get it? Then we move along by about the fourth trial. I just go, go for it. Come here, sit down, sit, stand down, stand, treat. That's seven behaviors for one treat. So our response reward ratio is already thinned down to seven to one. And in initial training, I generally run along at about that because I, I think out of seven responses, there's probably only one real fast or real pretty or real quality response that deserves a treat. I'm very discerning with my treats. They're like medals, gold medals, you know, silver medals. I don't just give them out because that devalues them so quickly and or at least makes them so your dog probably won't listen to you if you're in an open field or dog park and your dog's off leash at a distance and distracted and you forgot your bait bag. You've got no control over the dog. So I always want to check that we have control without food in my hand. So I phase out the lure very quickly. And then I do the same process, come here with hand signals only. 
And I'm keeping numbers, so I'm calculating what I call response reliability percentage. So basically, that is the number of responses your dog did, the number of command divided by the number of commands you gave times a hundred. So I can always check uh, for progress, improvement, uh, when we surpass personal best, so I can celebrate with the dog. Yeah. So the lure is, let me define a lure then. A lure is something that teaches the dog which, uh, teaches a willing dog which specific behavior is desired. But most people, because they don't face it out, and because once the dog learns hand signals and verbal commands, we don't need a food lure. So we phase it out, we go cold turkey entirely. But most people still have food in their hand, they still have food in their bait bag, and they often use it to coerce an unwilling dog, now an adolescent, to pay attention to them. That's a bribe. Yeah. So a lure is very different from a bribe. They both come before the behavior, the lure is effective for teaching which behavior we want. It's not for coercing the dog. Bribes are largely ineffective. They may work temporarily, but that's not a permanent change in behavior. Whereas a reward, of course, comes as a surprise after the behavior with no promise of a reward for sitting. It's not like eat your um, spinach and you get ice cream. It's by surprise, you reward the dog for sitting. Like I do things, I'll hide food rewards around the house, on the mantelpiece, you know, under a cushion. I even did it in the park down at, down over here. I hid them in trees and forks in the tree. So I went down to the park, empty-handed, no food treats, and said, Feeny, come here, sit, good girl. And I picked it out of the tree, and Rocket blew her mind. She looked up at this tree and looked for more. And for the rest of her life, every time we walk under this tree, she was looking to see if the <laughs> tree blew. <you> know? <laughs> I but. love that. I love that. So I think what's interesting is your, your how you rely on the reward, and the reward doesn't need to be food at all times, and that you're kind of reserving the treats to be more of a, like, more meaningful because if you're just kind of shelling them out one after one after one, they can lose their value. How, how would you work on this with like a heel? I see a lot of trainers online that they do, um, a heel where they're just giving treat after treat after treat for staying in position, especially for a dog that wants to pull and yank in every other way. Like, how would you work on that? Well, number one, I do it off leash. I would teach the dog to follow indoors before outdoors, at home before in public, so you don't look like an idiot. Yeah. Um, so off-leash following exercises around the house and room to room, around furniture. So you've got to build this like psychological bungee cord so the dog wants to walk by your side. Mm -hmm. So I'm never going to use the leash or any kind of collar, halter or harness to force the dog, to confine the dog, you know, chain him like handcuffs. He will walk by my side and you'll damn well enjoy it because I'll <laughs> stuff treats in your face. Yeah. So first we do following indoors, like eight weeks to 12 weeks, you know, because we can't go outside yet unless we're carrying the dog or yeah. have him in the car. Then I teach him to heal, which is much easier than teaching walking on leash because it's much more precise. And I teach it in one steps. So I go sit, one step, sit. That's the heel, and then treat. And then I go for two of them. Sit, one step, sit, one step, sit, treat. So I'm phasing out the treats already by asking more for less. Soon I can do six of those in a row. So now I go two steps. So I always go sit, heel, two step, because when you see the effect of one step, I've seen dogs just decompensate and go off like a rocket after you take one step. Well, imagine if you walk 20 steps in a row. Yeah. You've energized your dog before, you know, he can't pay any attention to you. He's so worked up. So the control is to sit by your side. So after one step, I sit him immediately. And then we have three steps and then four steps, five steps in a straight line. When I get to the end of the room or my garden, I turn around, come back in a straight line. Then I do um, turning in motion. Okay. And then a lot of speed up and slow down on cue. So I say, Rover, hustle, and then I speed up. Or I say, Rover, steady, I slow down. 
So now the dog learns what hustle and steady means. So if I'm walking at a normal pace and he's moving too far ahead, I say steady and he moves back into heel position. Then I put the leash on a trained dog and heal him on leash. Then I'm going to teach him to walk on leash. So that's the process. What do people do instead? Nearly everyone I know has a puppy. As soon as he's old enough to walk on sidewalks without risk of parvo, they put a snap on a leash and off they go. And in one walk, they teach the puppy to pull on leash. At which point, training now becomes combative. How do I stop him from pulling on leash? And we have, it's a billion dollar industry, all this equipment, these halters, these harnesses, these collars, that those that are slip collars or even pinchy collars. Or, you know, to me, it's insane to train your dog to walk by your side with Jamie. I even did the same thing with Jamie for practice when we're on sidewalks. And I would then take my arm off his shoulder And I was paying attention to what he did. He wanted to walk by my side. And as a dad, I felt really proud. I'm not holding his hand. I would always take hold of his hand if ever we crossed the street. But on the pavements, I watched him like a dog. And if ever he is moving, I just say statue. And he has to stand still. And we've practiced that in fun. So it works in emergency. But I think all this stuff to get a dog to want to walk by your side, I mean, it really is a bit overkill and making a mountain out of a molehill. And it turns, as soon as you add that leash on, we're going downhill. I'm sorry. So we do all our training off leash. The whole of serious puppy training classes, well, 50% are off leash unless we're doing walking on leash exercises. Because otherwise, if you train on leash, you see, you've turned training into a two-step process. You train on leash and convince yourself you have control, but you don't. And you find that out as soon as you let the dog off leash. And so you've got to train on leash. Then you've still got to teach off leash. So we just teach off leash first and then put the leash on the trained dog. Interesting. It's, just, it's so much, you know, it's more than interesting. It's common sense. <laughs> yes, you're very right. No, look, I grew up on a farm, right, doing all of this. I mean, my grandfather and my father trained the gun dogs this way. My granny trained the 14 farm cats this way, off leash, low reward training. My great grandfather won a straight line plowing contest with his horse with no reins. One horse, and he's sitting on the plow, just giving verbal instructions. Move on, slow down, uh, a little right, a little more right, or turn right. You know, because when you've got to plow a straight line, you've got to have precision commands. And he won. The, all the other horses were reined up. And so that I just grew up learning this stuff. I just gave names to it, like lure reward training or weight and reward training. Actually, Jamie named that one. It's in, it's interesting because I have definitely heard about working on leash walking indoors, like when there's or in low distraction environments and practicing, you know, before you get outdoors. But I had never, uh, and I might have read it in your stuff years ago. But at least when I'm kind of scrolling on the internet and learning and watching other trainers, I've never really heard of it spoken in the way you describe where we want to teach them off leash first, you know, starting low distraction and, and really uh, teaching what heal is. Because one thing I've been learning through trial and error is that heal is really less of like an action, right? It's more of a position. And that's how my mind works and thinking Mm -hmm. about it. Like when you're in heal, you're, you know, you're kind of right here. And I like how you talk about um, getting our dogs to want to do something. And that is kind of like the reward in itself. Yeah. It's, you know, that's a very perceptive comment you made right there. And very few trainers get this. Heel is a position. And the dog has to maintain position, whatever you do. And so a great exercise to teach heel is you stand still and you say to the dog, heel. And the dog has to move from where he is and come into heel position. And you lure him and position him. Then you turn 90 degrees and say heel. Then you turn 90 degrees, heel. Then you take one step, say heel. Until then, you can take one step or two steps 
turn 90 degrees, 180 to 70 degrees, clockwise or anti-clockwise, and say heel, and the dog has to find heel position. Then, as they do it in England, in motion. You just start walking and say heel, and the dog has to find heel position. And this is so important because of the way dogs learn. You see, if we teach a dog to sit, it's normally sitting in front of us or sitting by our side. And if it moves a little out of position, it might not sit. We actually test the response reliability of it. And so, for example, one yard away, you have about a 10% drop in response reliability. Three yards away, about a 40% drop. Five yards away, 60, and so on, till you get to zero. Now, you're saying sit, the same command the dog knows in these two positions, but he's like, I've never heard that word before. So that's how dogs learn. They're very fine discriminators. So if you teach a dog in the kitchen, 5 p.m., you have a good 5 p.m. kitchen dog. You, maybe your husband, can't control it at all. <laughs> but on the other hand, when you're at a dog park, you can't control it either. So we must train the dog in every possible situation, scenario, body position, and what we're doing. Luckily, there's very easy exercises to do that stuff. It's funny today, you know, I haven't talked about this stuff because it is so basic um, for years, since the 90s. But thanks to Jamie, it's all um, archived at Dunbar Academy. He had this bright idea to digitize his daddy's brain. And um, we put it all on this one website, so hundreds and hundreds of hours of seminars and what have you, and hundreds of hours of me training dogs. So you can see it and practice, because a lot of people learn better from seeing it. They, they don't actually believe it when I'm saying it, but when they see it, right. that you taught a dog park recall in one visit to the dog park, yep, pretty standard. We go to a dog park, dog won't listen to you, never has but you always somehow come home with your dog after he decides to come back to you, we're going to put a recall on him today in the dog park. And they go, well, I don't believe it. We do it all the time, you know. So, the and, I mean, the, the whole, um, I think you have a link where they can get. Yeah, yeah I'm glad you're bringing that. I, I, I slipped my mind, but I do, for anybody watching, you know, what he's speaking about is their Dunbar Academy. I'll have a screenshot here. And this is basically, and there is a special link where you get one full month completely free. It's linked down below for you. Um, but what's really cool about this Dunbar Academy is you get, as he said, hundreds of hours of uh, training courses, modules, and live and like, like actual instructional videos where you can actually learn kind of what he's talking about. And you actually coined and developed um, serious puppy training, which is in, I mean, it's an incredible puppy training course. And I know there's been um, questions in here about that, but this is kind of, I put a screenshot on here for kind of what some of the courses look like. You see there's essential puppy training, um, dog training, the series is in here, getting started with the Top Dog Academy. And then um, these are, it's a family business, which is really cool. You know, I'm really big. That's my crew. Yeah, that's your crew. Yeah. That's your crew. And you can, and it, like I said, you get a completely full month uh, free with this for the Top Dog Academy membership. So uh, it's pretty cool that you guys can like test it out. That's exclusive, you know, for this community in the link down below. And here's kind of a summary of what is included on there. And I know Jamie gets on and does these, uh, who's your son, who gets on and does these live webinar Q&As. So you get some more personalized uh, support, which I think is really important because even with videos, I know that sometimes um, there's still questions that come around. So I'm really excited and honestly really grateful that you're offering this to my community and those watching because it gives them- Especially um, for them. Yeah, and it gives them kind of like you said, like actual real life and video video instruction of how to do things. Because a lot of people are like me, especially watching videos like this, they're visual. So we can sit here and talk about it, but people who want to see it happen, really committed, I highly recommend that you you check it out. It's really incredible, um, and everything you do is really science backed. And I think that's really important because you and I talked about this before. There's a lot of emotions in uh, dog training, and it's really become divided, and it's really become become a heated environment to work in. And so, for those of us that just want to like get the facts, 
Use actionable stuff focused on positive reinforcement. Like this, this is your go-to place. Yeah, it's, I just seeing a question here from Peter. How do you punish a dog without a leash? Mm. Um, I don't see where the leash is irrelevant for punishing a dog. Mm -hmm. So by punishing a dog, we mean reducing some behavior that it's doing that's annoying you. So here is a useful maxim. What is your dog doing that's bugging you? All right, what do you want the dog to do instead? Define that and let's teach him to do it on cue. Let's say he's pulling on leash. I would say I'd teach him steady to slow down. More importantly, I would teach him heel, which means move to heel position. And once the dog is out of position, if you say heel, he doesn't really understand what you mean. That's why we did the exercise I just talked about. Take a step, two steps, three steps, turn clockwise, anti-clockwise, and then say heel. So the dog has to move to heel from every other possible, you know, position and action in the garden, say. Now you can use heel as a very effective correction or punishment, but you can say it sweetly. And sometimes when I'm really pissed off, I will say, Omaha, yeah. <laughs> heel, Ooh. good boy, or sit. And when I lower my voice and say it like that with a smile, the dog goes, oh, he's going to follow up. And by following up, I don't mean there's going to be an argument or I'm going to get nasty or hurt the dog or frighten it. I just mean this command is an essential command. It's a must-do command. There will be no discussion, no argument. You will sit. And if you make me repeat the command, once you've eventually sat, I'll say thank you mastering as much sarcasm as I can, and then you have to repeat the whole exercise. I'll step back and say, Rover, come. Rover, sit. Oh, good boy. I knew you could do it. Go on, go play. So yeah. just think about that. When I say, when I cue the, cue the word that it's must do, and I do that by changing the dog's name. So going into the ring, I change Omaha to Wahoo. So when I say Wahoo heel, it means it's a must do command and it's showtime. So try and muster a little style or as much as you can for a Malamute. So when the prefix is his formal name, then if he doesn't do it, I will keep repeating that command until he does. And when he does, and I count how many times I repeat it. Why? For the people who say, oh, you never repeat the command. Well, watch this. Look, I had to repeat the command eight times. Six trials later, I'm only repeating it twice. Fifteen trials on, he sits after every single command. We would only know that, you see, if we quantified, kept tabs of our results. And so we can graph it out and show improvement. Most people do it once and then moan at the dog. Well, the first time is always the hardest time. So, yeah, always think, what is the dog doing that's bugging me? Can I think of what I'd like? Like at the front door, it's jumping up. Well, how do you want him to greet visitors? You know, you want him to totter up on his hind legs with a silver platter and sherry glasses on it. Say, oh, how do you do? Jolly good show, come in. <laughs> that would that would be yeah. amazing. <laughs> no, and so I ask me, well, how do you want him to greet people? And they say, well, he could sit. I say, good idea. That's a really good idea. Let's teach him to sit when greeting people. And now if he jumps up, there's your punishment. You say, Rover, sit. Now, that's an example of something where the solution is pure in its simplicity, but it, in theory, but it won't work in practice. So you've got to troubleshoot it. You have a greeting visitors party. So I have all these training techniques for sitting in an armchair or having a party. You're going to invite 20 people to your house tonight and you're going to practice the dog sitting to greet each one. But since you know they're coming, you don't have to pay attention to them. The door's unlocked anyway. You pay attention to your dog. Rover, sit. I said, sit. Thank you. Sit. Good boy. That Sit. Good dog. Enter. Sit, 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 sit. Good dog. There's a good dog. Okay. Say hello. And your visitor's not a stranger. They've been instructed. When they hear the word say hello, get a food treat out to lure them to sit. Otherwise, they'll probably get a nose prod in the ghoulies pretty quickly and double over, you know, this flying furry missile you know, and they pet the dog only if it remains sitting. Then you tell them, do you want a beer? They say, yeah, so it's out the back door. Go out the back door, get a beer, come in the front. They're going to repeat the greeting. And each of the 20 guests will come in 10 times throughout the party. 
And by the end of that morning, the dog's got it. He now knows it wrote, ding dong, ding dong, better go back to my mat and sit. And not move till they say, it's, you know, and so when you sit and think positively, I actually hate that word because it's so ambiguous. I'm a positive trainer. What, you use positive punishment? I mean, this ambiguous terminology drives anyone. <laughs> yeah, confuses everybody. But when we think productively, let's say, whenever your dog's doing something that bugs you, write it down. Now write down what you're going to train the dog to do this week. I want him to slow down. I want him to come to heel. I want him to shush. I want him to settle on his bed. And then there's another question about are one word commands best? Generally, yes. But once you've taught dogs the meaning of commands, you can chat to dogs in perfectly constructed English sentences. Um, my two favorite sentences I've ever said to dogs are one to Claude. He was the one in the picture, the big red rottweiler hound and my most commonly said sentence to claude was claude shush get your chew toy go to your bed and settle down well the only words he understood were claude shush chew toy bed settle but i say it in a sentence my favorite all-time one was um, with phoenix i'd say feeny so feeny come here take this go to jamie please i just say please because isn't that a nice thing to do when chatting to a lady you know and then feeny runs off searching high in the bedrooms or low in the garden to find jamie and she sits in front of him and delivers the message we used to call it malamute mail and as a joke we used to write on it in like phoenix letters you know with a backwards e dinner's ready come quickly or it's mine. <laughs> this is incredible. So you basically the way I'm understanding it is instead of punishing our dogs or yelling or whatever, when they're, when they're doing something we don't want, what you're saying is we need to, in a sense, redirect them. Um, and then in an ideal world, it's almost thinking of this proactively or in a preventative mindset where we're thinking, okay, Here's the three things that my dog does that I don't really like. Okay, maybe excessive barking is one of them. So, okay, what could I have them do instead? And I'm doing this before this happens, right? Like I'm doing this when I'm calm and have my frontal lobe active. Think, okay, instead of barking out the front window, maybe I'd rather them go to place or sit or to you know, heal next to me, come next to me instead. Um, so we work on that in a low distraction, non-leash environment teach that. And then when they start barking, you know, hopefully we try to prevent it, but like when they do, then that's when we can punish them, which by punishing, we're saying we're just literally redirecting. We're giving them a different cue. So they're starting to bark and we're, you know, mm -hmm. Marlo here. It's like, shush, Marlo, sit or Marlo place or something like that. Is, is that a good high level summary? Um yeah, it's, it's much more than simple distraction or redirection. Okay. Though. You've probably, in a lot of your listeners have heard, I'm sure, of DROs, DRAs, and this is oh, differential reinforcement of another behavior or an alternative behavior, meaning a mutually exclusive behavior. No, it's much more precise than that. We are specifically telling them to do something. So for any vocalization, the single word shush means stop vocalizing, period. So it's not like I'm waggling food treats or saying, get your toy, get your toy. I'm saying, shush, you can continue what else you're doing. I just want you to do it quietly. And, and this is, I, I'm really bugged by barking, and especially when dogs are playing. So I don't allow dogs to bark or growl when playing. And I just use my voice to do it. They go, woo, woo. I say, hey, shush, shush. And if they try to resume play and bark, I'll just take hold of their collar. I said, excuse me, sit and shush, get a grip. There's a good dog, now go play. Good boy, good boy, there's a good dog, good dog. So I'll praise him hugely for being quiet now, focus on him, but he's going to learn to play quietly. So in that situation, let's say he continues to bark, like they're intense barking when they're playing or, you know, and you go up and you, you know, gently grab their collar and you say, shush, 
uh, Finnegan or Marlo, whoever, um, and they're quiet. So you kind of reward, but then they, a minute later, two minutes later, go back and they're barking intensely again. Do I just repeat? We, we do it again. Yeah, we do okay. it again. Or do we, or do we stop that play session so that they're no, not practicing? Okay. I want to stop play, but he may have to take a two to three second time out to calm down and focus on me. Um, I don't care how many times I have to do it. The dog will learn to play quietly and gently with, with, with other dogs. I mean, I, I love training the impossible. Like, as I say, teaching a dog um, a recall in the dog park or our puppy classes. While we're training the dogs, they're off leash with 11 other puppies. We don't wait for a quiet scenario with no distractions. and have their, We think, right, oh, puppy, you're going to learn how to play quietly in this room and to come when called or to sit when requested. And it just happens. And over the years, I found stepways stepwise ways to do it so it's mm -hmm. easy for the owners I, i'll give an example like in a puppy class okay. so i say let your puppies off leash and then five seconds later i say okay take your puppies by the collar that takes about two minutes because they're all over the place yeah so once everyone's got their puppets they say give your puppy a treat and say go play which will ultimately become the reward we won't need treats and they'll do that a few times and then i'll say take your puppies by the collar and have them sit and then I'll say, run up to your puppies and have them sit and then take them by the collar to pre you could, then give a treat, say, go play. Now we do it from a distance. So the owner sits in a chair and says, puppy, sit. And he sits. Well, why have him do anything else? He, he's shown to you he's in control. He, you know, you said sit, he sits immediately. So then I just say, go play. And I remember once with Omaha, he's playing with another dog. And he's starting sniffing her butt and the dog's owner was getting a little weirded out. So and I'm 50 yards away. I said, Omaha, sit. And he sits. And then the dog turns around to him. And I said, Omaha, go play. And he went around and continued. He didn't have to get up to continue sniffing again, you know. That's and incredible. So, and go play is the reward. Right. And so, okay, so going back to recall, a lot of... Um, trainers will recommend using shock collars, vibrate collars, things like that. And I know that's not necessarily something you lean towards at all. And I know we kind of talked about in the beginning, but I just want you to share a little bit more of why you don't go that route of using these for recall. And I'll, I'll explain one thing. One thing that I hear a lot is that uh, they use it more as a backup. Like they'll train with it, uh, with some kind of vibration or static shock. And then a lot of their feedback and what they'll explain is that, well, I only use, I only have it on my dog when we're off leash as an emergency backup. I don't actually, I rarely ever click the vibrate or I rarely ever click, click the, uh, static. So it's not really doing much to the dog, but when I have it on, they actually recall. What is your thought on that? And like, what is actually happening there? Well, the, um, it's whether they have a gentle leader or a shock collar, they're making the same mistake. They've turned it from a training tool, uh, whether you approve of them or not, into a management tool. It's become a crutch now, so they never take it off, so they never know what would happen. I would say, well, let's go to the dog park and let's just teach the dog a dog park recall. I've got an hour to spend, and it will take an hour because for the first 30 minutes, the dog won't even come anywhere close to me. So why train? I'd just be banging my head against a brick wall. Mm -hmm. But eventually we know this. So for example, to give an example, a case of a dog uh, had no recourse, it never comes when called, it's just driving me crazy. And um, I said, well, when do you let it off leash? Oh, in the dog park. You know, we, we do it every day. I said, well, when was the last time you went to the dog park? He said, well, to be honest, before I came to see you, because I wanted to try and calm the dog down a bit, you know? I said, what, this dog here? And he said, yeah. I said, well, then he came, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't have a dog to bring to see me. Yeah. You see, all dogs eventually come what come in the dog park when they are ready. That's when you should start training instead of punishing them for coming by putting them on leash and leaving the dog park. So when a dog comes to me of its own volition in the dog park, which always happens eventually because I've got his whole dinner in a bag, I'll say, hello there, hey, do you want a little amuse-bouche? 
or a starter, yeah, and I'll give them six treats, put my bag in my pocket, and I run off. I would say a good 80% of dogs run after me. So I stand still and say, sit, good dog, treat, treat. Then I run off again. Now I'm only walking away. Um, it's just a matter of trials before now. I can't get away from the dog. If I walk, I have a dog healing by my side looking up at me because I'm holding the bag way up here, yeah. you know. And then I give the bag to the owner and we're going to do yo-yo recalls. So we're going to separate each other by 25 yards. He's got the bag as a crutch. I don't have anything. But I've got training in the dog. And because I trained him, when I say, hey, Rover, come here, come on, pop, 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 and run away, he's going to run after me. And I'll get up to sit and say, good boy, I love you. Give him a, I love chest scratch. That gets through to the dog's brain really quickly. Oh, good chest yeah. scratch. Then I say, go play. Because that's the reward. I don't need a bag of food. I used it to teach the dog what I want him to do. And now it's a ma matter of how much of the training left a permanent trace, not everything, but a lot, sufficient for me to work it without food on my person. Um, but I think when you show people, I, I love, as I said, I love training impossible things and showing sometimes how difficult it is, but I always do it. And my favorite little video was actually, it was about a dog that had an over the top play style. And I was explaining how I dealt with it, you know, uh, come, sit, watch. And I pull out a tuck toy, which is a, a, a mega sort of secondary reinforcer. But in the course of filming this, so I'm sitting on a chair filming, right? And the dog is named Jambo was his name. Yes, Swahili for hello, Jambo. And um, he started humping this dog. Mm. And in the course of the filming, he did it five times. And each time he humped, you hear me say, Jambo, dismount. And he would get off immediately. So I'm filming with my voice. I say, Jambo, dismount. Then he gets off. Then he has to come back to say sorry. So he'd put his nose right in the camera lens and lick it, you know. Then he'd wander off again and get too worked up and excited. So he's humping again. Jambo, dismount. You know, and I had to do it five times. But the point is, I did it with no food treats while filming and sitting on a chair about 10 yards distant. And so to me, training is, it's, it's got the wrong name. I, I hate the word training. It's like you've got some trick pony or something. I call it teaching ESL, teaching hmm. English as a second language. Then I can communicate to it. I can tell the dog what I want him to do. I can use the words he understands in praise and say, that was a beautiful bit of healing. Yeah. yeah, you good boy. Use many, many different adjectives so it comes from the heart. But most important for dogs and their owners, you can use these words to act like a punishment. A dog cannot chase the cat if it's sitting. So can you teach a dog to sit on cue? Duh. And, um, you know, he can't uh, pull on leash if he's sitting. He can't jump up if he's sitting. You know, he can't perform noisy personal hygiene when we're watching TV when sitting. <laughs> so a, a single instruction, sit, can resolve, inhibit, reduce, eliminate, curtail a good 90% of behaviors that annoy us and get dogs a lot of grief and raise anxiety and frustration levels in owners because no owner really wants to get angry with their dog right. um, or or to jerk their dog or hit it. Or, or even use, you know, shock collars. Yeah. You know, I don't think a lot of them. Do you, I mean, do you think that there's harm in using those, um, like a shock or a vibrate collar, like do you, a prong collar even? Like, do you think those can ultimately cause more issues down the road and I'm sure they can and do, but more importantly, I'm sure that they aren't um, entirely pleasant. And my goal of training is that it should be quick, easy, effective, and enjoyable. Um, easy, why? Otherwise, owners can't master your complicated process, you know, without a degree in psychology or lightning quick reflexes. 
um, quick, otherwise they probably won't do it. Effective, otherwise what's the point? And a lot of training is ineffective. Yeah, just because we have a bag of food tricks and a shock collar on doesn't mean to say the dog is learning and minding. I don't even mention the enjoyment part. It goes without saying. When I'm working with a dog, I'm, that's when I'm happiest. I yeah, grew up on a farm, training the cows, the chickens, you know, the dogs. Um, I loved it. I found great solace in like communing with a non-human animal. And I was the boss for once as a five-year-old instead of having to listen all the time to my parents and yeah. the rules of the farm. And why on earth would I want to treat my best friends like my worst enemy? Why would I want to hurt them? But I don't like making value, subjective value judgments about the nature of uh, different techniques of right. uh, training or different types of punishment. I do it my way. I think it's the easiest. I enjoy doing it. When I can use a single word to stop a dog humping, it, man, releases happy hormones in my body. Even a bit of oxytocin, the love hormone. And I think, this is cool. My voice overcame the dog's sexual instinct and drive. Sit. And I feel the same when I see someone, say, training a you know, Lamborghini of a Malinois and heal yeah and one word controls the dog um or hunting dogs or sheep dogs i love working and playing with dogs in this room zuzu and i would dance every morning to love club <laughs> and um well the other one i like is what's it called revenge um because i like syncopated rhythms and so did zuzu and that to me is what training is. If you think about it, it's a choreographed, a choreographed performance where each of you will take the lead at different times, primarily the human, but when you screw up, the dog takes over. Like you should have twirled the other direction there. And I mean, I like when you see dog performances on the telly and I love when I see the, the handler made a mistake there, but man, that dog covered up so well. Yep. And just made it look a bit of flair and look good. So I think we got to track back and eliminate the word training, talk about teaching, talk about teaching ESL or language to dogs so they at least know what we want them to do. They don't want to upset us. Come on. All this rubbish about they're trying to diss us or what they're meeting in coffee bars, you know, today the coffee bar, tomorrow the world. I mean, I, I don't think so. They just want to have companionship and feel loved and wanted and for people to communicate with them. It reminds me of a hearing you speak about it. It reminds me of a relationship you might have with a friend, family member, significant other where there's communication and you are almost teaching each other how to treat each other in a sense, right? Like based on your responses and their responses and it's pretty eye-opening the way to, he to listen to you talk about teaching over training, um, kind of respecting the dog and what brings them joy. I think uh, this is pretty profound. And I know that, you know, this is all basic for you and, and stuff that you've been preaching for so long, but I'm really excited for those watching to get so much value from this. And I know we're, we're, we're at time, but I genuinely hope that I can bring you back on here in the very near future because I didn't even, I literally asked you one question and then we had all this incredible That's content cool. and yeah. I, it's more than I could have expected. I do want to say again, for those just jumping on that, um, the Dunbar Academy, um, I'll put a picture up here of it, uh, that you and your family have created with over hundreds of hours of courses. Anybody watching this right now gets one full month for free. It's linked in the description below. So you can kind of see what's included there. You get access to an exclusive Facebook group so you can actually get um, your specific questions answered. And I think that's really valuable and I'm really grateful that you guys are offering that to my community. Thank you. Yeah, it's. I mean, I love, I look on it as like Jamie's brainchild when he started digitizing my brain and by, you know, uh, filming the lectures. It is absolutely vast. Um, I had someone email me who binged watched the whole thing, watching about 12 hours a day, and it took them six wow. months. 
Wow. But we uh, do have a lot of simple, short presentations. So like for all your behavior problems, the behavior problem compendium is answered one, two, three. It's a different type of Ian that Jamie has a clock running. He's looking at me and he's doing this, hurry up. And I say, all right, barking. Number one, do this. Number two, do this. Number three, do this. So you can get some quick answers there as well and see some quickie videos. And my, my favorite part of it is actually um, they made me call it uh, Dunbar Redux. It's all my old stuff, you know, my old TV program from England and uh, the old Dog Star Daily videos, videos like um, Mr. Mousy and Mr. Carcass or the last time we filmed Claude, we were, we were filming one of our iWoofs and Dune broke through the door and Claude followed him and he blocks the camera, walks around, and so I just say, Claude, in your armchair, and he has a designated armchair because he's so big. And then Jamie swings the camera around and films him. And that's the last time we, we had him on camera. And we, he actually made a little video out of it for me, you know, playing a little song about Claude. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I don't know why I'm talking about that. I love but it. Yeah. I, th they are the things, I, I think, which are they're special to me because they're so old and they're they're dogs that have been buried for years, but I watch these videos to just relive them for a moment, you know. Yeah, and I, well, I think it speaks to your, uh, how genuine you are and what you do and you share. And I think it's a really great way to share your knowledge and your experience. Like, I just want to, I don't think you saw it because I think it was when we were logging back in, but we had somebody comment here. I wanted to read it saying, finding Dr. Dunbar when I first got a puppy has brought me four incredible trusting and connected relationships with my dogs that I never would have had if I'd followed other trainers that I came across at that time. So I wanted to well, share that with you. Thank you. Who was that? Uh, Renee. Thank uh, you, yeah, Renee. So she's a big fan of you and that's mm -hmm. um, powerful testament to your work, your experience. And, um, I'm just really, you know, I feel similar to you. There's no time that I feel more, um, in my own skin and feel comfortable and happy and, uh, just content is when I'm, when I'm working with my dogs, which is why I've created my whole livelihood around sharing that experience. Cause it just, mm. I, I wish everybody could find the thing or the things that bring them this sense of purpose and fulfillment that, that you and I have. So, um, I must I must say you are a very good interviewer, even though I spoke too much. I was panicked coming on because I've only seen your YouTube videos and you're talking a mile a minute. And I thought my poor adult brain won't even be able to decode the question, let alone <laughs> keep pace. So you're a totally different persona when you're interviewing. Oh, and, thank uh, you. Thank I, you. I, I, for speaking too much. No, don't. I mean... <sighs> man, we could go forever. I mean, I, I brought you on to hear from you. And it's funny you say that because that's my number one complaint, which is I talk too fast. And it's funny because I talk, I speak quickly normally, but when I'm really excited and passionate about something, it speeds up. And I love talking about dogs and I love filming. So unfortunately, my videos are very fast. I'm working on that, but thank you for that. Yeah, you're lucky that, I mean, you when you're doing the videos, you're talking quickly, you seem so happy and so energized. When I get passionate about a topic, my face changes and I look like a child murderer. Oh. I, I really do. I get really serious. But just serious. I'm, I'm just in it. I'm not angry. But a lot yeah. of people think, what went wrong with you today? Nothing. I just, yeah. I, I, I love this and I believe in it and I really want life to be a better place for dog people first and their dogs and um, oh yeah so I mentioned I'm working on a book at the moment I'm actually on a deadline now if you can believe it I'm in the oh, middle wow. of an 18 day deadline I don't have a moment to spare so I thought an hour doing this would be a welcome break but this is the first time I've written a lot of this stuff down it's in a few of my seminars like the science-based training with feeling but it's not written down anywhere so I'm getting it all in one book and I'm reading it through today and yesterday I had a little cry when I read the introduction because I thought this is so cool yeah. this is, it really moved me reading my own writing that you know this has got to get out there 
yeah. you know, so people know how easy training is, you know, and how much fun it is. And, and the joy of a dog that, you know, is well trained. And I mean, I love it, like positioning a dog on the couch. You know, we have some dogs that will do the vertical stretch. We have a nine foot couch, right? Well, no, we have one dog that can take up seven feet. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I, I would say, Duke, move your hind legs. And they come. <laughs> <laughs> to kind of suck it in and the rest of his body, his eyes are closed, yeah. he trunks out, he's on his back, yeah. but his legs come up and he looks like a little rabbit. Oh. And that it gives me so much pleasure that a verbal cue made him do that so he can stay on the couch because once I get prodded too many times, I just say, off the couch. And But I love dogs on couches. You yeah. Know? That's my time, man. Evening cuddles. All right. Well, I better get back to my okay. book. And well, thank you so much. I hope yeah. we'll do it again. We will. We absolutely will. And I will, as soon as your, when is your book coming out? Probably. Uh, October. Okay. So yeah. I will come back to this video in October and link it down below for those watching. Um, and I cannot wait to read it. I'm so excited. Oh, we'll do loads more videos between yeah, October. Yeah, of course. A lot awesome. of topics to talk about. <laughs> Get questions from your, you know, millions of viewers. Yeah, absolutely. Then, so thank you everybody right. for watching. Uh, don't forget to subscribe and please share this uh, with everybody you know because I think this could be valuable for.